Hi everyone, Rob Gabriel here, Senior Managing Editor and Home Security Expert at safehome.org. Today we have the privilege of sitting with Rob Chevelle. Rob is CEO of Delete Me, the online privacy company. He is a vocal proponent of privacy legislation reform and he has been quoted as a privacy expert in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, The Telegraph, and NPR, among other notable outlets. All right, thanks so much, Rob, for joining me today. We can go ahead and just jump right in. So cyberbullying and online harassment are obvious threats. Can you give me an example of cyberbullying and what can or should a parent do to help keep their child safe from cyberbullies? Cyberbullying can come in, I think, a lot of different flavors uh, as a parent or as anyone who, who is, is a parent, I think is familiar with different variants, uh, to use a popular term these days, of, uh, of bullying online. You know, they can come in innocuous forms, uh, such as uh, groups, of, uh, groups of kids that play a popular video game, multiplayer game, and exclude or, or harass somebody um, that's not part of the group, that's, but that's at school. Uh, or they can come in much uh, more severe uh, forms, such as, um, you know, uh, taking advantage of uh, somebody who's been doing limited uh, sexting as a teenager, uh, for revenge purposes or reposting of, um, of intimate, you know, messages and exchanges uh, for the, um, you know, for the express purposes of getting back at somebody. So, and, and even worse, uh, you, you know, th threats uh, uh, designed to, to really hurt, um, hurt somebody and make them feel um, suicidal or, or, or at risk of physical harm. So I think, you know, there's like in many things in life, there's a big continuum from relatively innocent to extremely dangerous. Great. And, and so access to inappropriate content, that's, that's another kind of recurring theme that we see. We don't want our eight-year-old, of course, to have access to uh, content that's meant for adult eyes only. Uh, so can you discuss some tools and tricks for uh, tracking or monitoring our children's online activity to keep them safe? I'm not going to bring up specific uh, solutions or vendors, but, you know, that's it, in some ways that's your guy's job. Uh, you can do the ratings and reviews. Uh, there's tools out there uh, and, you know, many of them are, are, you know, relatively fully featured. You know, as a privacy guy, I think those kind of tools cut both ways. And, you know, I think it's up to the parents to have the conversation with their kids saying, hey, look, you know, if you, you know, we're going to, we're going to either put in place a system where it's going to watch for you if you step out into the street and cross the line, so to speak. Uh, and we're going to get an alert. That alert might not tell us the exact details of what you did, but we're going to have a conversation as soon as it happens, something like that or an appropriate communication around uh, whatever technology is being used for monitoring, um, inclusive of everything from geofencing uh, to, um, to monitoring of chats for specific keywords and, and, you know, and that sort of thing. And, I, you know, I think, it, it, again, it's up to every parent to have a clear and transparent communication with their kids about what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what the norms are. And lastly, I'd say the danger of that is, you know, kids being kids will figure out ways around uh, rules and uh, constraints, uh, just like they've always done. Okay, and then there's also this idea of sharing team or parents sharing too much information about their family and kids on social media. So how much sharing is too much sharing and what are the biggest dangers in doing this? It's actually a, a growing problem. Uh, and we see it a lot with our Delete Me service, which is designed more for adults, you know, and to some extent families that, and, and what, what the service does, it goes out and removes a bunch of personal information, personally identifiable, identifiable information or PII about an individual, what we see happening 
in many cases now is that information gets repopulated somehow after we opt the customers out, the adult customers, because somebody in their family, a uh, kid or whatever, has innocently published a bunch of information that is 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 personal, either the the home address or uh, you know, their parents' names or their family relationships, or they filled out and registered for some game or quiz or downloaded an app, which is asked them to fill out these forms. And all of a sudden, boom, that information, which uh, our customers paid to have made private or more private is suddenly uh, being sold by data brokers again. So I think there's, there's, um, there's a number of risks around uh, kids being kids and using both social media and using different apps and games and things because their business models are often tied to getting data and selling it uh, as well as um, letting kids pay for things uh, directly. Okay, right. And so what are some things that parents should look out for to protect their kids from cyber predators? The threat of, of cyber predators is, is probably one of the scariest uh, uh, of them all for parents. Um, and yet, uh, I, I would say statistically probably the least prevalent. So I think the first thing to do is be rational. You know, you don't have to assume that there's sexual predators out there after your children, just because they're in, you know, a video game chat room or some such, some such, uh, uh, thing. However, um, I think if there's a, you know, I do think if there's any kind of behavioral change uh, in in your kids that you can see that's related to them potentially spending a lot of time uh, on their devices, you need to start asking probing questions. And I think one of the best ways to 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 test and learn whether or not there's there's a real risk out there is to ask very detailed questions, just like a, a detective would do of a, of a suspect almost, and then audit it. And then, and, you know, it, and, and by audit, I mean, say, hey, well, what did you chat about, you know, for two hours uh, last, last Saturday, you know, when, when you didn't want to go out to the party with your friends? And, oh, tell me very specifically, well, what was it? Well, what did that, what, well, what happened after that part of the conversation? What happened after that? And then, Go and take a look at the actual chat log, if at all possible. And if it all matches up, I think you got a you know a better degree of confidence that um, indeed uh, a your child is being transparent when asked about these things. So you can um, you can have a higher degree of confidence that if if something bad happens or they're approached uh, uh, by a by a cyber predator that. Um, They'll uh, they'll be able to talk to you about it um, transparently, and then you know. Lastly, I'd say um, these people can be pretty slick. Uh, you know, it goes without saying, but I think it's it's still worth uh, bringing up uh, and and educating your children that hey, when these cyber predators come, they are going to feel like friends. They are going to feel like people that really want to get to know you and are being very friendly and, um, you know, charming and charismatic. So if it, I would almost caution them if it feels, you know, if it feels too good, come talk to me and let's just make sure that this, this uh, person on the other end of the communication is really um, the person they say they are rather than um, some um, you know, wolf in sheep's clothing, so, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. And the metaverse is upon us, as you know, so we aren't just using social media and new technologies. We're actually going to be living inside of them, uh, which is both exciting and frightening if you ask me. So what are some quick tips that you can offer to keep our kids safe in the metaverse? It is going to be a, an interesting exploration of technology over the next, uh, five plus years. And uh, certainly um, there are opportunities for really interesting uh, new experiences. And there are lots of opportunities for um, abuse. All of the things we've talked about translate very well 
into the metaverse. Uh, and in some ways, the, some ways the threats and risks are uh, magnified for the same reason the metaverse is supposedly going to be a great uh, and interesting place because the fidelity of the experience is going to be immersive. Mm. And so I don't necessarily believe that there's going to be big new categories of risks just because you have an avatar and you're immersed in these virtual worlds in a way that you haven't been before. I think the risks are going to be fundamentally the same from bullying to predatory, uh, you know, behaviors to, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to kind of revenge doxing and, 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 and things like that. I don't think the risks will change. I think they'll, um, they'll be magnified in, in their emotional impact because of the worlds that are being built out there. Um, and so I think to protect against that, you know, it's more or less the same set of tools that we have today, ranging from education to monitoring to, um, and I think this last one is very important. We haven't talked about it before, pseudonymity. Uh, when you create your own um, identity in these uh, metaverse worlds, I think two things are important to remember. One, um, don't use your real name and your real information. And two, try to keep each identity that you have in each uh, in each world or app or game or whatever you want to call it separate. So that you're not easily identified across all of these things, and that you know, that's you know, being a privacy company, we uh, we try to teach those principles to adults as well as children, and they work for a reason. And it is important to compartmentalize your identities in the online world uh, for privacy reasons and for security reasons. So there are loads of threats, obviously, but. And there's a lot of things that parents can be doing to keep their family and their kids safe online. So looking ahead, what are the benefits of adopting healthy digital hygiene? One of the areas, um, you know, that a teenager, that every teenager has to navigate, uh, you know, sort of by definition of being a teenager is the, the, the gap between being a kid and turning into an adult. And I think from a hygiene perspective, one of the things that becomes increasingly important as you leave your house and go to, you know, go to college or university uh, and then enter the workplace is you start to want to um, uh, establish more of a clean slate uh, going forward. And so I think um, the ability to um, manage that process explicitly is is important and what what I mean by explicitly is everybody's got insta accounts and different social accounts and you use them in different ways and they're on snap and they're on tiktok and they're on this and they're on that and whatever the next thing is going to be three years from now and that's all fine. I mean, it's part of uh, growing up in the world today. The issue is what do you do at each um, life, uh, you know, sort of life event? Um, you know, one of them is, is probably turning 18 and leaving high school. And another one of them is entering the workplace. And, and I think being, um, having both education and a conversation about that and Googling yourself and understanding what's out there about you at each of those points and understanding what tools are available for you to control what's out there about you uh, is, is, is really important. And that's one of the most um, critical aspects of good digital hygiene uh, for kids and young adults as they, uh, as they grow older. All right, great. Thank you so much, Rob, for taking the time to sit with me today. That's all the time that we have for today. But again, thank you. And we wish you all the best into the future. Signing off with Safe Home.